Good morning. It's the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, and we are joined together to celebrate spiritual commun communion. Today's Sunday, October 25th, and we're glad you're here. Glad you have joined us to praise our God, to give thanks, to pray for each other, and to spiritually commune together with our Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. And that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negeb and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zor. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in his entire land. For all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the land in the sight of all Israel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. 
Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth or the land and the earth were born, from age to age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You sweep us away like a dream. We fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. Return, O Lord, how long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. Make us glad by the measure of the days that you afflicted us, and the years in which we suffered adversity. Show your servants your works, and your splendor to their children. May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hand, prosper our handiwork. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with the pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse, tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our Gospel lessons 
have gotten more pointed lately. It seems like the conflict in them is increasing. Things are starting to, to heat up. Months ago, Matthew began presenting Jesus as one who preached and taught and healed people. And through all three of those ministries, he announced that the kingdom of God was arriving. And Jesus invited all people to live kingdom life. The rich, the poor, the establishment, the outcasts, everybody. That's one of Matthew's central themes, and he reiterates it from the very earliest chapters all the way to the end. But recently, in these last couple of chapters we've been looking at, chapter 21 and 22, we've started hearing that some of those who received the invitation to live the kingdom life had bad attitudes. They had wrong priorities. And some of them were, were in danger of missing the kingdom altogether. Life in the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, involves displacement of the self. And it turns out that it was religious people who had the most trouble displacing themselves. Kingdom life requires full receipt of God's grace. And it, it calls us to change our attitudes and our actions toward other people. And it turns out that religious people often have a hard time with that kind of change. Recently, and I think a little ironically, Matthew has been showing us the problems with these religious people. Sometimes it's religious people who mess things up. Religious people who ought to get it seem more and more not to get it. In fact, sometimes they get things completely wrong. Sometimes they're more a part of the problem than they are part of the solution. Now, Jesus and the disciples have come to Jerusalem. They arrived in Jerusalem back in chapter 21. They went to the temple and they found themselves a good spot in the courtyard of the temple under the porch. And Jesus began to do there what he always did, what he had done for the last three years. He began to teach. He went on challenging people's assumptions and broadening their imaginations. And he did it right there in the courtyard of the temple, at the heart of the nation's religious life. Sure enough, one afternoon, a lawyer Pharisee walked up while Jesus was teaching. And just like those Pharisees we heard about last week, this lawyer Pharisee tried to trap Jesus. He was probably not sincere in his question. Now, he could have been. He could have just been asking a question according to the accepted um, rules of engagement in those days. One of the accepted activities, one of the accepted rules of public discourse was almost a requirement that people would respond to teachers. Hearers, hearers were expected to push back because pushback creates dialogue and dialogue opens up a space. Dialogue sets up an energy field in which insights can be sparked. So maybe the guy, or, or the guy could have been just asking as was expected, but what we heard about last week, and what we heard about that, uh, that one who asked about the, uh, uh, the earlier confrontation, um, it suggests that this lawyer Pharisee wasn't innocent. He was probably wanting to trick Jesus. He said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? And that's a good question. And Jesus answered that good question with a line that, that has become famous. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. Bam, there it is. All of kingdom living in a, in a nutshell, in a soundbite. It was a great answer to a question that was probably insincere, but was still a good question. Just like last week when Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God, Jesus answers this week, love God, love your neighbor. And then it was Jesus's turn to ask a question. He told the disciples, those, uh, those, not the disciples, the Pharisees, he said, let's talk about the Messiah. Whose son is he? And I can picture them looking at each other and maybe huddling together, murmuring. They probably wanted to prepare a good answer. Then one of the, then one of the Pharisees clears his throat <clears throat> and he says, here's our answer. We say the Messiah was David's son. And that was a pretty good answer. At that time, there were, there were several different schools of thought when it came to the identity of Messiah. Each one of these different schools of thought emphasized a different character quality of the Messiah or a different aspect of the Messiah's ministry. And so they had a different title for the Messiah. Some called the Messiah king. And that was because their focus and their program was political. Another group called the Messiah Savior. They were political, but they were also religious in their convictions. A third group looked for a, a Messiah whom they called the Son of God. And a fourth group looked for a Messiah that they called the Son of Man. And those last two titles, the Son of God and the Son of Man, they indicate an important distinction at the time. There was an important division, a, a, a deep division in public opinion. People who thought about the Messiah and looked for the Messiah, they, they disagreed about the Messiah's true nature. Some said that he would be divine. Others said that he would be an exceptional human being. So, so the, the, those Pharisees were being careful with their answer. Whatever answer they gave would position them. And as we think about it, they were probably trying to do exactly what Jesus was good at, answering in a way that didn't pin them down, answering in a way that, in, in vo that, that avoided falling into a trap. We saw it last week. We saw it in the lawyer's question about the greatest commandment. Here it is again. Matthew is hammering it home. The truth that Jesus was wily. He was hard to pin down, hard to trap. He was not like the usual members of the religious establishment. Although he could hold his own with them. He could hold his own with, with those who were the leading theological thinkers of the day. And he was the son of a carpenter. He was from up there in the sticks, right? Up there in Galilee. So the Pharisees went with an answer that was ambiguous. Son of David was ambiguous. It, it gave them some wiggle room because some people thought that the title son of David meant that the Messiah was divine. Others thought it was just a family name and it indicated uh, humanity. Either way, it could go either way. And so those Pharisees thought that it, that it got them off the hook. But it, did, it didn't. Jesus didn't let them off the hook. He said, sorry, guys, your answer isn't clever enough. Remember what King David said once? David used a title for the Messiah one time. David called the Messiah, my Lord. David wrote it in a psalm, a psalm in which David had God speak to the Messiah. 
God said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies at your feet. David called the Messiah Lord. So how could the Messiah be both his Lord and his son? It was another one of those clever answers of Jesus. Like last week and like the answer to the lawyer Pharisee. Jesus must have been a master at public religious debate, right? A master at finding the perfect response, a way to answer that, that broadened the scope of the question, that, that was expansive, that was larger than the limits of the question. The larger point that Matthew is making in these last couple of chapters is 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 clear right and we saw it again today in today's encounter and, and we and we get matthew's point with that last line in the lesson with his conclusion no one was able to give jesus an answer nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions after today's lesson all questioning is shut down. There's no more public give and take between religious thinkers. Matthew is telling us that in today's exchange, Jesus's public ministry turned a corner. Today, the focus of, of Jesus's public life changes. From now on, Matthew's gospel is going to rush toward its tragic conclusion. Some of these same people, I think, that we, that we heard about today are going to be among those who see to it that Jesus gets silenced. Some of these same leaders might be the ones who are going to shift from public debate to a plot to execute Jesus as an enemy of the state. So we need to get ready. In the next several weeks, things are going to heat up even more. The conflict between Jesus and the establishment religious leaders of his day, it's, it's going to grow in the next several weeks. We're coming to the end of the church year. And as we move to, toward All Saints Day, and then Christ the King Sunday, and then, and then the year will come to an end, and we'll move soon to the first Sunday of Advent, let's keep our eyes on how Matthew is presenting Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on it. Let's pay attention to how Matthew presents Jesus as different, in, in incredibly different from the religious establishment. And also, let's not be religious people who mess things up. Let's be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Amen. Let's affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your faith, let me start again. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Today we pray especially for Jan, Jim, Ed, Bob, Sue, Susan, Selena, Ed, Carol, Dave, Mary Ann, Cheryl, Kaylee in Fort Worth, who is six months old and recovering with COVID. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Using the words of Psalm 63, let us pray together. O God, you are my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore, I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live, 
and lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. In union, O Lord, with the faithful of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. We present to you our souls and bodies with the earnest wish that we may always be united to you. And since we cannot now receive you sacramentally, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. We unite ourselves with you and embrace you with all the love of our souls. Let nothing ever separate you from us. May we live in you and may you live in us, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love, in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The wisdom of God, the love of God, and the grace of God strengthen you to be Christ's hands and heart in this world. In the name of the Holy Trinity. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.